and they thought that what if we drop some pornography like magazines all over Hitler's you know where he's staying he walks outside he picks it up he becomes deranged and loses his mind because there's all these naked women I don't know again exactly how that's going to work so they pitched this idea to like an, a colonel in the air force or the army air force so they said how about this we're going to make Hitler go insane we're going to drop this stuff and he said he basically kicked him out of his office like <laughs> you have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> Well, my guest on the Freedom Pack podcast today is historian at the University of Texas, John Lyle, author of Dirty Tricks Department. John, welcome to the Freedom Pack podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to talk about this topic. And so am I. It's one of these topics that, you know, I I, I don't really venture into this sort of stuff on the podcast too often, but when I hear a um, a story like this when I read a book like this it's just one of these things I just feel like I have to talk about and more people need to hear about because you know I think a, a lot of people will be surprised on on some of the things we talk about today um, yeah I think I think so and one one of the reasons I really wanted to write this book you know I'm, I'm a historian so I want to make you know points about history and all that but one of the things that really captured me about this is it's just a good story yeah. <laughs> there are just lots of good stories in here and I feel like sometimes historians tend to lose sight of the narrative and the story for maybe different kinds of details I wanted those details in here but I also wanted just a good story so hopefully that comes across a little bit Oh, absolutely, man. And, and, you know, I think a lot of people will be excited here. I mean, I, I did a history degree at university myself. Granted, I, I wasn't the best student, but I'd never even heard of this stuff before. So, you know, I think a lot of people will be surprised. So just to set the scene, um, mm -hmm. I mentioned there the Dirty Tricks Department. Um, before mm -hmm. we get into the detail of, you know, the OSS, the R&D branch, etc., just if you could explain to everyone listening, um, what this was, what its purpose was, what it was trying to achieve, and maybe explain some of these terms like OSS. Yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll start with the OSS. That stands for Office of Strategic Services. This is kind of the precursor to the CIA in the United States today. The CIA is established in 1947. The OSS is really the World War II equivalent. Its purpose, it's established to um, collect intelligence from abroad, to analyze that intelligence, to spread disinformation. And one of the branches within the OSS, the one that I focus on in this book, the R&D branch, the research and development branch, its purpose is to create the weapons and disguises and gadgets and forged documents that these undercover agents are going to need on their missions abroad to gather this intelligence. So that's really what this book is about, this specific R&D branch within the OSS and the different kinds of things it creates for these agents and how they use them on their missions. So I want to fast forward before we carry on with this origin story, before we talk about the likes of Stanley Lavelle, William Donovan, and the really origin story behind this. I'd like to just fast forward because what I love to do with podcasts is try and grip people's attention as fast as we mm -hmm. can. And then once they're hooked, we can give them the rest of the information. So just skipping forward, let's get everyone hooked. What is the most sort of out there tactic or idea that was floated by the OSS in World War II that comes to mind? What What do you think will make people, you know, sit up and listen right now? Well, the I think the most outlandish kind of insane and interesting tactic that's being used by this R&D branch that I write about is one called Operation Fantasia. This is a psychological warfare technique. Uh, the idea is the OSS wants to demoralize the Japanese. And so that's what turns into Operation Fantasia. It's an attempt to use glowing foxes to scare the Japanese into submission, basically. The guy who came up with this, who's working for the OSS, his name was Ed Salinger. He was a businessman, and he had worked in Japan for a long time, and so he knew the language, he knew the culture, and he knew that within the Shinto religion, there are these kind of spirit beings called kitsune, and they take on different animal shapes, and one of those shapes is a, a fox, a glowing fox. And supposedly, this kitsune, this fox, if you see it, it represents a bad omen. It's a portent of doom. Something bad is going to happen if you see this. Salinger's idea that he pitches to the OSS is why don't we create fake kitsune, fake glowing foxes, or maybe even real ones, and put them in Japan, 
and they're going to run around the countryside and the Japanese are going to see them. And because of their superstitions, they're going to think that this is a bad omen. It means something bad is going to happen. Well, what potentially bad will happen? We're going to lose this war. That's the main thing going on. So the idea is that we're going to demoralize the Japanese. So this actually got pretty far in development. There were several different um, things that are created for Operation Fantasia. They created fox whistles, fox sounds, fox odors, fox balloons with the idea of spreading them in Japan. But kind of what I realized searching through the archives, they actually captured live foxes. The OSS did live foxes, got glowing radioactive paint from the American Radiation Corporation, painted these foxes, and the idea was that we're going to release these live foxes in Japan. There were several experiments that were done as part of Operation Fantasia to see if this would actually work. One of the experiments was to see if the paint would actually stick on animal fur, because it's got to stay on the fur for it to remain glowing. So they went to the New York Zoo, they got a raccoon, and they painted this radioactive paint all over the raccoon, and it actually stayed on, at least for, you know, during ordinary raccoon shenanigans. So that experiment seemed to go well. Another experiment was to see whether foxes could actually swim, because if or you're going to get these foxes in Japan, you're going to have to release them near the shore, and they're going to swim to shore. Um, so... Several of these foxes were captured. They were painted with glowing radioactive paint. They were towed into the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, and they were thrown overboard, hopefully to swim to shore. Now, it turns out the foxes actually did swim to shore, but it didn't quite go according to plan because the paint washed off in the water. So that didn't quite work. So there, there are a few more experiments that went with Operation Fantasia. There... Ed Salinger even took this further, saying, if these foxes don't work, I have another plan. We're going to, we're going to, you know, uh, get some people in Japan who are sympathetic to the Allies, and we're going to get them to scream crazy things about foxes, and then maybe it'll make the Japanese think that they've been possessed by this kitsune. And then the most crazy part of this plan, which I found in the archives, is one idea that Salinger has, after he drops these foxes in the Chesapeake Bay and realizes the paint might wash off, he's got to come up with a new idea. His plan is to capture a fox, uh, you know, a, a dead fox, taxidermy it, and he's going to slather it in this paint, this dead fox. He's going to attach it to a balloon. The balloon is going to float over Japan with this fox underneath it. And then attached to the fox's head, he wants to put a human skull with a jaw that can lower and raise. The idea being, he's going to blast some audio in Japanese saying, you know, this is a bad omen, the war is over, you might as well give up now. So the idea, in short, is to taxidermy a fox, cover it in glowing radioactive paint, attach it to a balloon so that it looks like it's flying, and then have a human skull attached to its head with a jaw that raises and lowers that looks like it's shouting at the Japanese at least that's what he thinks, you know, is going to really win this war. So that's Operation Fantasia. It eventually gets canceled before it can actually go into operation. One of the main guys, one of the main men of, of my story is Stanley Lovell. He's the head of this R&D branch. He eventually gets to the point where he thinks, what are we thinking here? Why are we wasting money trying to do this? We have a lot of other ideas that are probably more practical, so let's go with those. So that, in short, is probably the oddest uh, uh a strategy that was cooked up by the OSS during World War II, Operation Fantasia. Yeah, that's a that's a crazy one, and I, I guess that it's more rather than you know targeting the enemy directly. I mean, it, is the premise behind that to sort of hope it that it, it sways public opinion in Japan rather than you know the military seeing it and reacting to it? Uh, yeah, he wants to sway public opinion, and th there are several different instances of how this is trying to be done during World War II. Uh, a few other psychological warfare operations similar to that, one targets the Japanese. One, th there was one idea that what if we drop bombs into Japanese volcanoes and we blow them up and we make it look like these volcanoes are exploding. Mm -hmm. The Japanese might think that the gods are upset with them and then maybe they'll realize that, oh, they must be upset with us because we're engaging in warfare. We better stop. That was one idea. There was one psychological warfare idea that targeted the German soldiers in particular. This is one of my favorite ones. It's called the German League of Lonely War Women. The idea was that the OSS would print up these pamphlets, and it would drop these pamphlets all over the German soldiers. And the pamphlets would say something to the effect of, you know, patriotic German soldier, if you go to the, you know, pub or bar 
and you wear a certain pin on your lapel, there are going to be women walking around. And if they see that pin on your lapel, they're going to sleep with you. This is the, the lonely war women. Now, this seems an odd thing. Why would you want to encourage these German soldiers to think that, hey, they're going to be sleeping with all kinds of people? I mean, it seems like wouldn't that boost their morale rather than lower their morale? Well, the idea behind it is to make the Germans think that a lot of German women are signing up to join this League of Lonely War Women. And so the intended effect is that the German soldiers might think, well, who are all the women joining this league and sleeping with other German soldiers? It could be my girlfriend or my wife or my daughter or something. And so the, it was kind of a, a kind of roundabout way to demoralize them to think that their you know wives and girlfriends might be cheating on them. So I think everyone listening now, I think everyone's probably taking a step back and they're thinking, what what is this right now? What are we talking about? So we're not just talking about, you know, some people may be thinking we're, we're talking about some sort of, you know, uh, independent vigilante setup. No, this was this is a government, but this is like a legit project, right? Oh, yeah, this is definitely legit. The OSS, like I said, is the precursor to the CIA. Um, so it's as legit as any other government organization. Now, admittedly, these are some of the more bizarre schemes that it comes up yeah. with. There are several other inventions and devices and, you know, documents and disguises that are much more practical. But these are certainly part of the things that's within its uh, purview. So before we explore some more of those uh, ideas, let's go back to the origin, as I, as I mentioned there. Who is Stanley Laval? You mentioned him there. Uh, how did he become involved in all of this? And what, what, what was his origin story in regards to the OSS? Yeah, Lovell is a, uh, a New England chemist. He's from around Boston but, uh, before World War II. He had gone to Cornell. He worked as an industrial chemist for several different shoe and leather companies. So nothing that would indicate that he's destined to you know, develop all kinds of devious devices. But when World War II starts, he gets recommended to the OSS. He is friends with a, a man named Vannevar Bush. And Vannevar Bush was kind of President Franklin Roosevelt's unofficial science advisor. And so Bush knew that Stanley Lovell was uh, a scientist, but he was also a businessman. And the OSS and some of these organizations Bush felt like they needed someone who could speak both of those languages, both science and business. So he recommends that Donovan, uh, William Donovan, the head of the OSS, hire Stanley Lovell. So Lovell eventually meets Donovan. He's kind of recruited to go to OSS headquarters in Washington, D.C. Donovan walks in um, and he says, I want you to be my Professor Moriarty. You know, this is kind of the 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 nemesis of Sherlock Holmes in the novels. Uh, so that's the nickname that Stanley Lovell eventually gets. He becomes the Professor Moriarty in the sense that his job is to create all the devices that the OSS can use to sabotage the enemy during this war. So that's how he gets this job. So he becomes the head of the OSS R&D branch. And as you mentioned, he was recruited by um, William Donovan. Who was he and what made him the right man to, to lead something like the OSS? Donovan is a World War I war hero. He had earned the Medal of Honor in World War I, one of the most decorated American soldiers in, uh, at, at the entire time. Um, and so he had become a lawyer after the war. He had run for the governorship of New York after Franklin Roosevelt, you know, became president after he was governor of New York. Donovan didn't win the governorship, but he was fairly close with Franklin Roosevelt, even though they were from differing political parties. And Donovan began agitating Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s to create some kind of organization that can coordinate American intelligence. Because there were several different organizations at the time, army intelligence, naval intelligence, and Donovan feared that if war breaks out in Europe, as it looked like it might, we don't have one centralized intelligence organization that can coordinate all intelligence and analyze it, all of it that's coming in, and then inform the president what's going on. So Roosevelt eventually kind of gives in to Donovan's demands and creates this organization, the OSS, and appoints Donovan as its head. So when he brings um, Lavelle, and this is a you know a job where there's no you know there's there's been nothing like it before. There's no sort of blueprint to what you're supposed to do. There's obviously a lot of room for creativity. What sort of guidance was Lavelle given? You know, upon appointment, what was the sort of job description, so to speak? Because I imagine he walked in quite confused as to what his first move was going to be. 
Yeah, in fact, Stanley Lovell was fairly morally conflicted over whether he even wanted this job. After Donovan asks him to do it, he meets Donovan at his house, and they have a conversation where Lovell basically says, I don't know if if, if I can do this. I, I'm just a chemist, you know? I, yeah. I, I don't engage in creating weapons that kill people or anything like that. And Donovan basically told him, well, you know, you need to suck it up because this is war, and that's just how we're going to have to do it. And so, you know... One of the main arcs of this book is seeing Lovell's moral transformation mm -hmm. from someone at the beginning of the war who's very reluctant to engage in these nefarious practices to at the end of the war, he's someone who's eventually advocating for the United States to use weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons. So that's one of the big transformations that you can see progress throughout this book. Um, uh, can you can you remind me of what the second part of that question was? I, I know you had mentioned um, sort of what, what what was his um, almost job description when he came oh, on? Yes. Like what, what guidance was he given? Uh, well, this is the funny thing is he's not given much guidance at all. You know, mm. he, he's not really told what to do. He, In fact, he doesn't know what weapons to even start inventing or who to recruit to help him. He asks Donovan's right-hand man, basically, what does Donovan want me to do? What, what does he want? And, and the guy tells Stanley Lovell, he says... Donovan is a doer, you know, he's someone who, who does things, not who really thinks deeply or too long about something. If you want his respect, do something and then show him what you've done. Don't ask him for permission to do it. In other words, ask for forgiveness, not for permission. And so that's the guidance Stanley Lovell is kind of given. Now, originally, the United States doesn't have a very long pedigree of these kind of secret warfare tactics. To get inspiration and ideas and help, Stanley Lovell and a group of people within this OSS R&D branch actually go to England to, to see the British and to see their organization, the SOE, the Special Operations Executive, and see the kinds of devices that they are creating to get inspiration because they have a longer pedigree of this kind of stuff than Stanley Lovell and the OSS does, which is a new organization. So that's one of the thing, things Lovell does to get help is to go visit the British and see what kind of things they're creating. And based on that, he comes back to the United States and starts creating and hiring people to create some of these weapons. Some, some of them are like time pencils. A time pencil is a device that you can set it and after a predetermined amount of time, it'll explode. So you might want to attach this to like what's called a limpet. A limpet is a small mine or a small explosive device that you can attach to the bottom of a ship and then you can set a time pencil to that. You can attach it. You will row away, and you can establish an alibi somewhere else. And then by the time that it explodes, you're not there. So th those are a few of kind of the early simple devices that Stanley Lovell and his branch are creating. Those two are especially are inspired by the British. Wow. So that's something I didn't know. So that um, Britain had its almost own equivalent of of um, you know the, the, this project. What sort of things were, were going on in Britain at the time that they could take, um, you know, inspiration from? What sort of ideas were being touted in, in this English version of, uh, of the OSS? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so th there are different... There a lot of these weapons especially are various kinds of bombs. Like, how do you cam camouflage an explosive, a bomb? One of the kind of more humorous and interesting ones that the British come up with is called a rat bomb. The idea behind the rat bomb is to get dead rats, like roadkill or something, and taxidermy them, cut them open, and fill them with explosives. And then you would put these rats in like a coal reserve, like a German coal reserve. And the Germans, when they're shovel shoveling the coal into their boilers for their locomotives, for their trains to run, if they see a rat, they're not going to take the time to pick the rat out and throw it away. They're just going to shovel it in too because they don't want to deal with it. Well, if the rat's filled with explosives, they're going to shovel it into their locomotive, to their boiler, and it's going to explode and it's going to destroy their train. So that's the idea behind the rat bomb. The OSS does something very similar. The OSS develops, or, you know, Stanley Level's R&D branch, they develop something called Black Joe, which is kind of based on the same idea. Black Joe is basically like fake coal. It looks like coal, but it's not coal. It's hollowed out on the inside that you can stuff it with explosives. And the idea is the same. You throw it in a coal reserve, they're going to shovel it into their boilers, and it'll destroy their engines. So those are uh, a few of the ideas. One of the more interesting ideas that the British equivalent, the SOE, comes up with is like itching powders. They put itching powders into uniforms of German soldiers and even condoms that were destined to like German areas where troops were. Um, so the itching powders was one thing. And then, yeah, the rat bombs. There are all kinds of 
one of the joke that jokes that kind of recurs throughout the books is different kinds of bombs that sound like rat bomb, like rat bomb, there's bat bombs, there's cat bombs. So there's a lot of variations on this theme within the book. <laughs> Amazing. So what was the sort of first um, idea or ideas that um, Lavelle, you know, got his teeth stuck into? What was the sort of first project he or first idea that he started to develop once he realized once he realized what his job actually was mm -hmm. the the first two are probably what i mentioned the time pencil and the limpet mm -hmm. but one of the early ones that the oss is really excited about is that level pitches the idea for a silenced flashless pistol something that you could shoot and that you couldn't be seen say if you wanted to assassinate an enemy guard you could you know kill them without being noticed um, so this a silenced 22 pistol is one of the first things that the OSS is working on in collaboration with the company High Standard. Um, this actually gets developed, and it it becomes probably the most useful or one of the most useful weapons that the OSS creates during the war. It's going to be used later all throughout, even to, up to Vietnam, the Vietnam War in the 1970s. Um, but one interesting story related to this silenced 22 pistol is that. William Donovan, the head of the OSS, is really um, proud of what the R&D branch has done in creating this pistol and wants to show it off. He wants to show it off to President Franklin Roosevelt because, hey, it helps to have friends in high places. So why don't we impress Roosevelt? And he's going to look on the OSS really highly if we do that. So Donovan knows Roosevelt fairly well. He gets one of these silenced 22 pistols to show off to him. He sticks it kind of in his coat. He walks into President Roosevelt's office. He drops a bag of sand in the corner. Meanwhile, Roosevelt is dictating a letter to his secretary, so he's not really looking at the door. He doesn't know Donovan's in there. Donovan pulls out the gun, and he unloads the clip into the bag of sand in the corner that he had placed there. After a while, Franklin Roosevelt kind of smells a little, it smells like burnt gunpowder. He turns around and he sees Donovan standing there with a gun in his hand and an empty clip. He had apparently just unloaded this thing. And Roosevelt is very impressed, the fact that he hadn't even heard this. And so, uh, you know, that's kind of one of the strange and interesting tactics that Donovan tried to use to cultivate uh, kind of Roosevelt's favor with the OSS. That's that's a pretty badass moment. <laughs> so what kind of, um, in terms of the recruitment process uh, for the OSS, what were the kinds of people they were looking to bring in? Were there certain traits they were looking for? Uh, yeah, especially for an organization that's involved in intelligence gathering, one of the most useful things that they'll look for is foreign language ability. So anyone who can speak a foreign language, especially if you're, if you're like from a foreign country, if you're from Belgium or if you're from Germany or something and you have a knowledge of the terrain and the language, that's especially useful. Now, the OSS also did recruit Americans to do many of these sabotage missions or to train people abroad who would then conduct these missions. One of the people that I focus on in the beginning of the book to explain kind of how the uh, recruitment and training process worked is a guy named Roger Hall. Uh, through Roger Hall's story, it kind of shows like some of the interesting things that these OSS recruits learn. For example, in order to pass their final test to become an official OSS agent, the final test is to go to an American defense plant. So somewhere where they're creating either weapons or something secret that's classified. And you have to steal in information from the plant and show it to the OSS just to show that you have honed these abilities and are able to do that. And so Roger Hall does this. There's an American defense plant uh, that he goes to. And his cover is that he's seeking a job. He wants to get a job there, so he's hoping he can get an interview and maybe a tour to see what they're making and see what the layout is. So he goes there, and there's a young kind of secretary who he's talking to, and he makes a really good impression on her. And she says, well, how about I get you an interview with my father, who's the vice president of the company? And Roger Hall thinks, well, this is great, of course. So the next day, he and the vice president of the company, they have a meeting together. Roger Hall is shown all throughout the building, the warehouse where they're creating, you know, whatever they're creating. So he's got a layout of the place. He knows who's working there. He's got all the secret information. Then the vice president wants Roger Hall to go to lunch with him. Now, of course, Hall is using a cover name. His cover name is Robert Hawthorne. So it's not his real name. So they, they decide, okay, they're going to go to lunch in the, in the plant cafeteria. Well, it turns out there's a war bond 
rally happening in the cafeteria that day. And the vice president walks up to the podium and he says in front of everybody in the plant, I have someone here who's, you know, he's been in the military. He's a hero and blah, 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 blah. This is Roger Hall's cover story. He hasn't done any of this, but he realizes, oh, he's talking about me. And so the, the vice president says, now come up here, Robert Hawthorne, the cover name, and give a speech to these people and tell them how it really is. And so oh. Paul is thinking, oh, my gosh. So he starts limping to the podium because he said he was a wounded in war, which he never was. But of course, he has to act like he was. He starts limping up there. He gives a speech where he tells people, you got to buy war bonds. You got to write to the soldiers abroad because, you know, they don't want to go to mail call empty handed and all this stuff. He gets a standing ovation. The vice president shaking his hand. The secretary, his daughter is clinging to his other arm and Roger Hall is offered the job, but of course he never comes back because he had passed his OSS mission. So that, that was his final test. Wow. That's like everyone's worst nightmare when they lie on their job resume and then their boss asks them about the bit. They yeah, they're called about. out on it. Yeah, he, he, he was able to kind of swindle his way into doing it. But yeah, it must have been nerve wracking. So... So we've got the we've got the OSS DNR, and then coming off we had the weapons division, and then it was documents and camouflage. Yes. Am I right? Yes. So it would the OSS is kind of the main organization. Yeah. And one of the branches within that, the the main one that I talk about in the book is this R and D branch, R &D. the research and development yeah. branch. Yeah, led by Stanley Level. Now that R and D branch itself is composed of three different divisions. I know yeah. the kind of organizational hierarchy is a little complicated, <laughs> but OSS R and D branch, and then within the R and D branch, there's what's called Division 19. Yeah. This is in charge of creating all the weapons for these undercover agents, like the limpets that I talked about like the Black Joe, like the Silence Pistol, all those things. There's another division within the R&D branch called the Documents Division, and this is responsible for forging all the documents. So they would hire forgers to you know, create passports and train tickets and ration tickets and even foreign currency to give to these agents on their undercover missions. So some of the people that they hired for this documents division, they were in prison for forging like money or whatever, but they're really good forgers. And so yeah. Stanley Level goes to prison to recruit them to work for the OSS. And hey, maybe I'll put in a good word for you afterwards. So that's the documents division. The third division is the camouflage division, which is in charge of disguising these undercover agents. So they were in charge of getting like authentic German clothing or European clothing, authentic, all, all down to the tiniest of details. So for instance, in Germany, they use a different kind of, well, at the time at least, a different kind of stitching on their buttons than you would in the United States. So instead of like cross stitches, you might use parallel stitches. Well, the... The camouflage division has to know all of these tiny little details so that these undercover agents won't get caught. And so that's what it was in charge of doing. In addition to that, the camouflage division was also in charge of creating um, like secret message containers. So if you wanted to... Uh, if you wanted to take a secret message from one place to another, you obviously can't stuff that message in your pocket because if you're searched, well, somebody's going to pull it out. So they were in charge of creating kind of secret message containers that you could stuff a message in to get it from one place to another. One of these would be like to hollow out a pencil and to stuff the message in a pencil and, you know, put the eraser back on. It looks like a pencil, but really yeah. it's hollow inside. Another, one of the most ingenious, I think, is for a female agent. The idea would be to get a tube of lipstick melt down the wax and then put the message in the tube and recast the wax over the message so you know if you take off the if you take off the top of the lipstick container it looks just like lipstick but inside the lipstick is the secret message so there, wow, there are a yeah. bunch of different schemes like that to transfer these messages wow so intricate and um i remember you you talking about in the documents division there was a guy um, who went by the name Jim the Penman. Yes. yes. Just yeah, how good Jim was the, he? Yeah, Jim the Penman, he, kind of a renowned forger, uh, again, sprung from prison by Stanley Lovell during World War II to help this, uh, this documents division. It was said that he could forge or recreate basically any signature. So he had a, kind of a, a, a running bet around the office. So he, he would bet his colleagues 
to sign their name. And then what he would do, he would take a pen, he would study kind of their signature. He would recreate their signature up and down the page, right you know, above and below where their original signature is. And he would bet them $5. Can you pick out which one your original is? So apparently he won more often than not. So he could recreate whoever's signature. This is the kind of thing he would do for the OSS, especially on official documents. If they needed a, an undercover agent to have a, let's say, travel order saying that you can go from one place to another, well, that has to be a so signed by some official. And so he would recreate their signatures. And these guys who were taken out of prison and, and you know, um, thrown into these projects, what happened to them after the war? Were they, you know, was there any, were there any deals struck or did they just head straight back to prison? Well, it's, it's hard to know. Um, for Jim the Penman in particular, Stanley Lovell says that at the end of the war, he doesn't know what happened to him. You know, he probably just ran off before anyone could get him because he doesn't want to go back to prison. Yeah, yeah. What Stanley Lovell says is that at the end of the war, he went into his office, his own office, and on his desk was a piece of paper, and it said, thanks to an understanding boss, signed, you know, Jim the Penman. But Stanley Lovell says, it was in my own handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> Or we yeah, so go. apparently Love some it. of these guys they they kind of they kind of uh, ditched town before the war yeah, ended yeah. just so they they could escape. Now I, I will say there were other people within the organization who didn't like this practice of hiring criminals, who are hiring people who are sprung from prison. One of those, a guy in the documents division, is named Willis Reddick. He was kind of a just a helping hand, a printer for Stanley Lovell. He didn't like this idea because he said, well, how good could they be? They already got caught. So if mm. they got caught once, well, you know, they're probably going to get caught again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Um, tell me about the pursuit of um, the truth drug. Um, how deep did that research go and, and how did it eventually sort of, uh, you know, inspire and, and, and lead into sort of MK Ultra? Yeah, so... For any intelligence organization, one of the things they're going to have to do is interrogations. you got to get information out of people. This idea of a truth drug has been around for a long time, even thousands of years with something like alcohol. People have known for a long time that, you know, you ply with someone with drinks and their inhibitions lower. They might be more liable to say something. Well, the OSS, especially Stanley Lovell and his R&D branch, are looking for another kind of drug that can do something similar. Can we find a drug that can lower someone's inhibition so that they talk? But not only that, maybe there exist drugs out there that can prevent the brain from like creating new ideas. And if that's possible, but then you can't invent lies. You can't create anything. So the only thing you can say is the truth. Okay, so maybe these drugs is, exist out there that can guarantee that what someone tells us is the truth. That's what the OSS is after. So they get several different kinds of drugs, and they hire a few people to test these on different people. One of the people that's hired uh, to test these drugs is a narcotics officer named George White. He works for the Bureau of Narcotics. Stanley Lovell hires him because he has connections to different criminals throughout New York especially. And this is going to be useful for these tests because if George White can test these drugs on the criminals and they confess to their crimes, it means that there might be something to these truth drugs because they would have, wouldn't have otherwise talked about their crimes unless this drug was working. So one of the main drugs that the OSS is testing for a truth drug is THC acetate, which is like the main psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. They don't really know, you know, exactly what it does, but it seems to lower inhibition. So it's one of the main ones they're working with. So George White gets this drug from Stanley Lovell. He injects it. It's a liquid. He injects it with a syringe into a cigarette, and then he would pass these cigarettes out to these criminal contacts and see if it got them talking. Now, according to George White, it actually worked pretty good. Like they actually did start talking about their work. Stanley Lovell gets very excited about this. And there are several of these tests that are done during World War II. There's another truth drug test that's done on members of the Manhattan Project. So this is the secret, you know, American project to develop the atomic bomb. Now, the idea is that if we can get them to talk about their work, they, they there's no way that they otherwise would have. So that this must guarantee that the truth drug works. So several members of the Manhattan Project are subjected to, to some of these truth drugs. It doesn't seem to have worked as great as when George White was talking about it. Many of them just got sick and started throwing up, and so, you know, it didn't quite work. But this has a really, really important legacy, these truth drug tests that Stanley Lovell had uh, implemented. Because after World War II, when the Cold War starts, the CIA is created. There, there... Well, in the CIA, the... 
um, the Soviets and the Chinese are are developing methods of mind control. You know, there have been people who would confess to crimes that they didn't commit, like at the Moscow show trials. And the idea is, why would they confess to these crimes? Maybe they've been manipulated some way into doing that. So the CIA becomes really interested in different kinds of truth drugs and mind kind of control devices. One of the projects that it begins to look into these areas is called MK Ultra. The head of MK Ultra is a chemist named Sidney Gottlieb. Gottlieb doesn't really know where to start researching these mind control techniques. And so what does he do? He goes to the archives and he looks at the former work of the OSS. And what does he come across? He comes across the work of Stanley Lovell and these truth drugs. And he decides this might be where I need to start working. And so Sidney Gottlieb hires George White, the very same person that Stanley Lovell had hired to conduct these truth drug tests. Sidney Gottlieb hires him for the CIA to conduct similar truth drug tests, except at this point in time, the drugs had kind of evolved. Instead of using THC acetate like marijuana, they're starting to use this new drug that was created called LSD. And this becomes really, you know, uh, kind of synonymous with CIA drug testing during the Cold War, but there's a pretty direct inspiration from Stanley Level in World War II right to Sidney Gottlieb and MK Ultra during the Cold War. I'd be interested to know how, how Level would um, sort of reflect on that now, given that, as you mentioned at the start, he was sort of very reluctant, um, you know, uh, you know, taking up his role. And it'd be interesting to see how he would sort of reflect on you know, where that work eventually led to in some sort. Yeah, my my hunch is that he would react similarly to the way Sidney Gottlieb eventually did when this became public, what he was doing. Sidney Gottlieb defended what he had done as vital to national security. Sure, it might not have led to much, but we it, these are tests that we had to have done to make sure that at least, you know, this isn't something that the Soviets are going to exploit. Or, you know, what if someone drops LSD into a water supply of a major city? How are people going to react? What's going to happen? Well, we need to conduct these unwitting tests to make sure. At least that's how Sidney Gottlieb defended himself after the fact. You know, at the end of World War II, well, after World War II, I, uh, well, during my research for this book, most of the people who are subjects in this book are basically all of them are dead, but I had the chance to interview some of their grandchildren, Stanley Lovell's grandchildren in particular. And one of them told me that he had gotten into an argument with Stanley Lovell about the atomic bomb because Stanley Lovell supported the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of the war. This grandchild did not support them. So they got into an argument and, you know, the grandson, he raised the kind of objection. What about, it's like Pandora's box. We don't know what this is going to cause. We don't know what's going to happen. Is it going to inspire other people or give them permission to do the same thing? And Stanley Lovell kind of just dismissed it by saying, we're an inventive people. We'll figure it out. So scientists had created these weapons. They would also figure out how to control these weapons. So he just kind of had this faith that, you know, we would figure out how to control them. I think that's probably how he would react had he lived, you know, long enough to see the inspiration to MK Ultra and all that. Um, so I, I think that's probably how he would. Now, in fact, he actually did have some direct, more direct connection to MK Ultra because he knew about some of these LSD experiments that were going on. Um, wow. One of the most famous um, events that happens during this MK Ultra testing during the Cold War is the death of a chemist named Frank Olson. Frank Olson worked for what's called Fort Diedrich, and Sidney Gottlieb, Gottlieb, the head of MK Ultra, dosed him with LSD at this kind of retreat. Frank Olson goes insane. He jumps out of the you know uh, 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 the hotel window and he dies. Stanley Lovell, Lovell knew about this incident, and we know that because there's a there's a diary entry. It's like a summary of a conversation between a couple of people. And it says, Stanley Lovell knew of Frank Olson, you know, knew of his suicidal tendencies and blah, blah, blah. So we don't really exactly know how much Stanley Lovell knew about this MK Ultra program, but he knew something about it because he was a, after World War II, he became kind of an independent consultant to the CIA. And so he knew about some of this going on and he might've consulted with Sidney Gottlieb also. Wow. Wow, man, you can make a movie about this guy's life. I mean, uh, it's crazy how dr the dr how dramatic a shift there is in in Lovell's character 
you know, right at the start where we were talking about, you know, he was, he was just a chemist. He was reluctant. He was almost talked into this role to sort of advocating for, for, for weapons that can cause such devastation. What was it that, how can we explain such a dramatic shift in someone's character? Because that's quite a rare thing to go from one extreme to the other. Yeah, I really think, well, there are, there are two things. One of the main ones I really think is just his exposure to the brutality of war. Before you're involved in war, especially the most devastating war in world history, it's easy to be a pacifist because you don't know. Uh, it's easy to say, well, of course we shouldn't harm people or anything. But when you see the brutality of war, um, it becomes a lot easier to want to defend yourself against that and to create these weapons to do that. Another really important thing for Stanley Lovell in the change of his mind is that he has a son. He has a son that's in the military. And the sooner the war ends, the less likely his son is going to die. And so he has a really personal stake in this. So at the end of the war, again, I talked to his grandson and he was telling me that, you know, Stanley Lovell was advocating in part for the deployment of atomic bombs and all these other weapons that he had created because his son was midway across the Pacific waiting to engage or waiting to become involved in a mainland invasion of Japan. And if he did that, well, I don't know how great of a chance that he would survive, but probably not that great. And so Stanley Lovell has a personal stake in this. The sooner the war ends, the less people, including his son, who might die. And so let's end the war as soon as possible. How can we do that? We've got to develop these weapons. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man. That's a, that's a really good theory there. Um, I, before we start to wrap up, I'd love to talk about some more of this psychological and uh, sort of wacky ideas. But... Um, mm -hmm. before we get on to them, I just wondered why why did you think they sort of could discern that Hitler may be insecure enough to be able to um <laughs> I don't want to give them away, but these these ideas that I, I'm gonna talk about before we get there, why did what intelligence did they have to suggest that he may be uh insecure enough to be subject to these ideas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, there is a psychologist who worked with the OSS, a Harvard psychologist. His name was Henry Murray, and he was tasked with doing a psychological profile of Adolf Hitler. Are there any, any vulnerabilities within his psychology that we can exploit, maybe do some psychological warfare techniques or something? Mm -hmm. So Henry Murray wrote this report, an analysis of Hitler's psychology. And in that report, he identified a few things that might have indicated that Hitler had what we might call today like a fragile masculinity, that he verged on the more feminine, something like that. This is what Murray kind of reports. Um, so Mur Murray says that, you know, he was prone to outbursts and very emotional and all kinds of stuff. And he equated this with the more feminine. And so he said, you know, maybe there it's possible that he's kind of on this spectrum more towards the feminine side. Stanley Lovell reads this report and he realizes, well, what if we push Hitler further along towards that feminine side? Maybe we can demoralize him or make him go insane or something like that. So Stanley Lovell has this idea. What if we inject female sex hormones into the vegetables that are destined to Hitler's plate that he's going to eat? Um, and if we do that, maybe he's going to eat these vegetables. Maybe it'll kind of tip the balance of his fragile masculinity. Maybe it'll make him uh, grow breasts. Maybe his, his famous mustache is going to fall out, maybe, you know, all kinds of stuff. And maybe he'll, again, become demoralized. And it's not quite clear like how this is going to help, but this is the idea at least. And so Stanley Lovell says that he got this female sex hormone and he had given it to a gardener who supposedly grew the plants that Hitler ate when he was at his Eagle Nest retreat. Stanley Lovell says that uh, he doesn't quite know what happened to the female sex hormones. Apparently it never you know, got to Hitler. Either the, the gardener took the money and kind of ran away or Hitler, he says, had a big turnover in his tasters as they were <laughs> trying to preparing his food. Um, but anyways, that, that, that was the idea at least. This raises a bunch of questions. You know, second question raised to this is if you can get female sex hormones into these vegetables and get it on Hitler's plate that he eats, why not just inject poison into them and kill yeah. Hitler in the first place? Why, yeah. you know, try to demor, you know, so there's a few kind of iffy kind of flaws in the theory, but that's the idea at least. Mm. I wonder with this idea. Were they hoping that he would um, become so demoralized that he almost gives up on his pursuit? Or were they hoping that it would sort of 
push him towards making more impulsive and, and rash and ill thought decisions? What do you think? Yeah, well, I, I think an analogy can be drawn to something that was done in the Cold War to Fidel Castro, or the idea at least. During the Cold War, the CIA wanted to do something similar to Castro, the head of Cuba. The idea would be to inject LSD into his cigars. He would smoke one of these cigars, let's say, before he gave a broadcast to the nation. And of course, the LSD would make him kind of hallucinate and appear to be insane. And if he did that, then the people might lose faith in their leader. They might realize that he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's out of his mind. And so maybe something similar was being done with Hitler. If we can make people lose faith in him, well, that's the source of his power in the first place. So maybe they'll give up on him. You know, So I don't know exactly that that's the case, but I would assume that it's probably analogous to what was trying to be done with Fidel Castro. The, the other one that um, I wanted to ask you about, because I really, <laughs> I couldn't understand the... Um, the idea behind it in, in terms of what this person who came up with this idea was hoping to achieve or the result would be. But it was this idea of dropping vast amounts of, of pornography uh, over where Hitler was. What what was the idea? What, what did he want to actually do? Was it literally a case of just dropping pornography from the sky? And sort of what do you think he was hoping to achieve by that? Uh, yeah, this is another case of, of apparently... The idea is to demoralize Hitler or make him go insane so that people think he's crazy. But Hitler didn't like pornography. And so the idea was that th this isn't an OSS idea. This is a, a different kind of idea, but it plays into the psych psychological warfare. The idea would um, – a, a couple of airmen had this, and they thought that what if we drop some – pornography like magazines all over hitler's you know where he's staying he walks outside he picks it up he becomes deranged and loses his mind because there's all these naked women i don't know again exactly how that's going to work so they pitched this idea to like an, a colonel in the air force or the army air force so they said how about this we're going to make hitler go insane we're going to drop this stuff and he said he basically kicked him out of his office like <laughs> you have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> so that didn't go anywhere but that was the idea at least again it's kind of hard to see what how would that affect things? But, you know, hey, they're thinking of it. A hundred percent. It's crazy because, you know, you, you think of, um, you know, uh, war strategy and, and and organizations like this is, you know, really you know, by the book, everything, you know, everything makes sense. But you start reading stuff like this and you think that they must, you know, in a situation of total war, all logic must go out the window and you're almost thinking, man, whatever works, we'll try it. Yeah, I mean, I think that is the philosophy of Stanley Lovell. I mean, of course, you already have the conventional weapons that are being used, tanks and, you know, bombs and all kinds of stuff. Well, in a war like World War II, Lovell's philosophy is, does it really hurt to at least try things that are unconventional, try things that are out of the box? Nine out of 10 of them aren't going to work. And we know that going into it. But in order to find the one out of 10 that does, we have to have a lot of ideas. So we got to play around with a lot of stuff. The philosophy is, we're just going to throw a lot of stuff against the wall and see what sticks. So he knew that going into it. But of course, it does produce all these kind of wacky schemes that you know are kind of the unintended side effect of that as well. Now, that being said, there are several really practical weapons that do come out of the R&D branch. One of the more practical ones, more, one of the more useful ones that I like to talk about is called the mole. It's kind of this simple but ingenious device, the mole. It's a an explosive device that a saboteur can attach to a train, like the un, under, un, underneath a train. And the mole is able to detect a slight change from light to dark or from dark to light, something like a change in light, the mole can detect. The idea being, whenever the mole travels into a tunnel, there's going to be a sudden change from light to dark, and that's going to set off the mole and it's going to explode. And it's going to derail the train. And more importantly, it's going to derail the train inside the tunnel because it's gone from light to dark. And so this is not only going to, you know, prevent the train from getting supply, like German supplies, say, from A to B, it's going to prevent any other trains from going along those tracks because the tunnel is plugged up so this is a very useful and kind of ingenious uh sab sabotage device that's created by the r d branch i tend to like the more simple devices more than the more complicated ones because yeah. they, they do seem more ingenious to me well, the simplest of all the devices that's created by this r d branch branch is just a, like a, a three-pronged piece of metal and it doesn't sound like much but it the idea with that would be however it falls 
on the ground, like if you throw them out on the road, no matter which way it fell, one of the prongs would always point up. And so it could, you know, burst the tires of whatever drives over it. So it's super simple, but it's really ingenious. Just the the geometry of having one always point up. It's great. Yeah. (laughs) So as we start to wind down then, reflecting on it all now, how successful um, would you say that the OSS was in its mission and, and how much of an impact would you say it had on the, the outcome of the war? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't think like, like any particular of these devices was like the thing that won yeah, the yeah. war or anything like that. I mean, there's, you know, D-Day is a lot more important. You know, <laughs> there, there are a lot of specific events that are a lot more important than some of these devices. That being said, some of these devices are very important, especially for the sabotage missions and for the intelligence gathering missions that the OSS used to help plan some of these other stuff things. Okay, so, so that's what I think is the really important legacy of the OSS, a really important contribution of the OSS. Um, so especially the disguises and the documents that allowed these undercover agents to get into Germany or wherever occupied France and gather the intelligence and sabotage specific things. That's what's really important. A lot of these other schemes are fun and they make for a good story, um, but it's not like they were integral to the war effort. There were some things that were really important, though. Again, the documents, the disguises that helped these undercover agents gather the intelligence that the United States and allies used to plan some of these broad, bigger missions. So I think that's probably the more important contribution of the OSS. That being said, one of the more lasting legacies of the OSS, especially this R&D branch, is what we talked about earlier, inspiring this MK Ultra program. Um, that's going to have huge consequences because the R&D branch inspires this, and th- these kind of unwitting drug tests go on for decades in the United States. In the 1970s, this is exposed by a few government committees. This leads to huge reforms and oversight for the intelligence com- uh, community, the CIA, the NSA, the FBI. So this has really, really long-ranging effects, kind of uh, all stemming back from these experiments that are first conducted in World War II by this R&D branch. I suppose before we let these guys know where, where they can find uh, more from yourself and the book, my last question would be, why don't we hear more about this stuff? I mean, I I studied history throughout um, my high school, throughout I, I did uni- uh, history at university. You know, um, I, a lot of people out there will you know t- you know watch uh, watch a lot of the History Channel and read a lot of books. It doesn't seem that this doesn't seem to be something that they they teach to. This these stories don't seem to have entered the mainstream yet. And I guess that it, it takes people like yourself to bring them to the mainstream, but why don't you think that we hear too much about this stuff? I I think there's probably a few reasons. I I feel like one of the reasons is what we just touched on. Some of these devices, it's not like they're the most important thing in World War II. Yeah. So I'm, I teach American history, or I've taught a lot of American history at in college, you know, at community college or University of Texas, Louisiana Tech. I've taught at a few different places. And when I teach, especially when I teach intro American history, I have maybe one lecture to cover World War II. <laughs> okay. so in in, yeah, in yeah. one hour, I have to cover the entirety of World War II. Well, there are a lot of other things I've got. I, Pearl Harbor and, you know, D-Day yeah, yeah. and whatever, you know, there are a lot of things. In one hour, it's just not feasible that you're going to get to m- much of this stuff. So that's probably yeah. one reason. If you take just a, you know, intro American history or whatever, well, a lot of this stuff is important, but there are a lot of other important things that are, you know, important for the development of the United States. So you're probably going to have to learn those first. Another yeah. reason is that in order to learn this stuff, a lot of it's in the archives. A lot of these stories aren't published anywhere. I had to find them in the archives. Mm-hmm. Well, if 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 you're not a historian like myself, you're probably not going to archives looking for these stories. And so you're not going to know about them if you don't go to the archives. So it takes a historian in order to go to the archives to find them in the first place and then hopefully publish them. And then it, you know, just because you find a story and publish it, a lot of people aren't going to read it. I mean, I don't know how much my book is sold, but it's not like, you know, everyone knows about it. Mm-hmm. So the, there are probably a lot of great stories out there that have been found and have been published, and we would love to know about them. But I, how do you know which book to read? It's, it's just a really hard thing. So that's probably another reason. Well, I think it's extremely important for, you know, another reason in terms of people may click on this podcast because 
you know the the topics really you know it's really enticing you know that some of the things we've mentioned some of these wacky ideas might draw a lot of people in that otherwise have really no interest in in studying history and they might listen to this podcast and they might be really hooked and engaged by these you know this really interesting story and it might lead people to you know listen to the whole podcast and think well what do you, you mentioned d-day there maybe what's that maybe i'll look into that and you know yeah yes yeah. these sto- it takes these stories sometimes to really grip people and engage people to sort of bring them into the subject and then you know their learning can kick on from there so i think what you're doing is really important um i love the book i love listening to, to your interviews so let's let these Thanks guys so know yeah. where they can find it where, where can they find uh, the book and where can they connect with yourself Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, the the book it, you should be able to find it online. You know, it's on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or you know, if if you have a local bookstore that keeps it in stock, I would encourage you to do that. Support the local bookstore. That's always nice. If you want to find me, uh, I'm on Twitter at John Lyle, J O H N L I S L E, and I I don't post that often, but when I do, it's usually a cool document or picture or something. Thing from the archive that I've found. So if you're curious just about what a historian does day to day and you want to see like what we find in the archives, that's mostly what I do is just post cool images and documents from the archives. So if you want to, you know, keep up with that, uh, you can find me there. I, and I, I want to say that, that that is a really good point that you make about history in general, drawing people in. I have a PhD in history. I've studied history for a long time, but when I was young, I did not like history. It was so boring. I thought it was just the most boring subject, but then I realized there are neat stories like this. In particular, there are certain aspects of history I like more than others. My PhD is in the history of science. When I realized that, oh, I can study scientists of the past and I don't have to worry about all these other things that happen in history. I mean, it's important to know a broad context, but there are certain time periods or people or events that I'm more interested in. So when I realized that, oh, I can study those, I don't have to study these other ones that I find more boring, that was a real kind of turning point for me. Maybe I do like history, I just haven't been exposed to the particular kinds of history that I actually like. So that was big for me. So hopefully, exactly as you say, there are some people who might be interested in some of these topics and realize history isn't just boring. There are really cool stories. Maybe it's just been packaged in a way that doesn't interest you so far, or maybe you just haven't heard a particular story that grabs you like some might others. So don't lose faith in history. You know, there's there's good stuff out there. <laughs> beautifully put, man. Man, you're going to be fired up. I love that. It's a beautiful message. Look, I'm, I'm a big fan of yours. I love what you do. I, lo- I hope to hear much more from you and, and see more books from you in the future. Thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Me too. And thanks for having me on. I appreciate it.